All right, thanks so much, everybody. I have the distinct pleasure of traveling around the world and talking about innovation, of course, how technology transforms us, not just within the marketing space. So we'll definitely get into programmatic architecture and ad tech and how to deliver the right message to the right customer at the right time. But what I really like doing is taking people out of context and talking about the broader set of technologies that are transforming our lives. Because there's a lot going on right now. And not only do I get to see the differences across distinct cultures adopting these types of technologies when it comes to AI, especially in a more connected landscape, but I also start to see patterns across different regions in terms of how people are adopting these types of technologies. To the degree in which I've created a framework and a maturity model to be able to understand and how to get to that path from a brand perspective, how to be a mature AI-enabled organization, and also how to be a more distinctive marketer as a result. So lots of big themes are taking place right now when it comes to these derivative technologies. This is almost here, right? So taking a visor, Google Glass tried to do it, but really being able to visualize through classification engines, being able to understand objects at scale, connecting the dots with all of these different pieces and structuring them into bits and pieces of information that we could now start to understand. It's really the architecture of intelligence that I'm talking about here, but we don't have to move very quickly into this space in order to understand how technology is transforming us at this very grand scale, right? The reason why all of this connectivity is happening is because we're embedding little chips in all of the distinct pieces so that they can talk to one another, right? Who knows when IoT is really going to happen, but it's starting to happen very slowly. The more that we start to adopt these types of technologies with semiconductors that are connecting our devices with one another, we're noticing this compounding exponential trend that is taking place. And I find it most interesting when we can augment our own intelligence, especially when it comes to examples like this. This is Su Gwen Chung. I have the pleasure of speaking with her on a panel at Con Lion in France uh, in about a month. And what she does is she uses biometric technology to model her own movements as an AI is replicating those different type of distinct patterns, augmenting her own creative process. That is mind-blowing right there. Being able to model after these distinct patterns and creating these wonderful abstract patterns using fractals and biometric type of technologies. But we don't necessarily need to be at this level to understand how technology is transforming our lives, right? Because each and every one of us is interacting with the tools that we have at our disposal right now. How many calories, how many distinct steps we've taken to fundamentally understand our metabolic rates, how many calories we need to burn in order to get to our benchmark goals. All of these things are really at our disposal and at our fingertips right now which is quite interesting. So what I try to understand are the fundamental drivers of how this innovation is taking shape. And it always comes down to exponential change. What you're looking at here is a relay-based computer built with vacuum tubes circa 1965 or so, probably half the size of this room built around the perceptrons that could now start to make calculations. So we're all talking about electric impulses in order to get to distinct output for computation. And it used to be really, really arduous to get these done, right? To get this kind of computation power that is actually now in your pocket. The supercomputer, like I mentioned, in your pocket is a million times smaller, several hundred thousand times more powerful and a million times cheaper than the best communication device. Only the US president had just 30 years ago. Only heads of state and the president had this type of communication technology, but now in 144 characters or less, the president could embarrass himself and the entire country, just like that, right? It's fascinating to see these types of things. So these types of technologies are affecting and impacting every bit of our lives. Think about the new infrastructure that's been created with Facebook and Google, the walled gardens of the universe, right? Voice, voice is going to be the new battleground. Why are companies leveraging these types of technologies to create this new kind of arms race? Why do we want to create brands that 
can talk, that can feel, that can have a personality, that you can empathize with, right? What are we missing here? There's something really unique about this arms race to do that. Anticipating desires is going to be the very first notion of this. That's why we, we do predictive marketing. Seismic is known for this. I have my colleagues right here that could talk to you about it after. In terms of how to predict the potential of every moment to capture somebody's attention. And then from there, really anticipate their needs. Spotify is my favorite example, right? For one whole week, I could listen to Future, Kendrick Lamar in the weekend, and then the next week I could listen to Otis Redding and Sam Cooke, and then it'll start to tee up all of these distinct types of artists that I never would have known possible just because other people have listened to them before. Nina Simone, right? Going way back. So it's very interesting how these types of technologies are now becoming more disruptive, but also very intuitive. And I always pin it back to this. I promised myself since 2012 that I would show this slide no matter what I'm talking about, because this is something very unique. Some of you may know about Moore's Law. Some of you may know how Moore's Law, its capacity has been doubling since 1965 or so, but this is Ray Kurzweil's version of Moore's Law. And what you're looking at here are these dots on the line here. Over here is just a time scale, but the dots represent the best price performance computer of their day. This includes the mechanical device that took the census in 1890, the relay-based computer that cracked the Nazi Enigma code in World War II, the vacuum tube-based computer that predicted Eisenhower's win, and into the modern semiconductor era as we know it right now. So what Gordon Moore was saying in 1965 when he wrote this arbitrary paper on semiconductor manufacturing optimization for fab yields given a certain defect density, it wasn't until Carver Mead carved that out and was like, he distilled it and he said, whoa, what he's really saying is there's something really fundamental about this industry, the semiconductor industry, that on a fractal scale is much more significant perhaps at a cosmological scale. And it was Ray Kurzweil that said that because of this, this scale, this time scale, humanity's capacity to compute has been compounding for as long as we've been able to measure it. Hence, your iPhone should be better than the one last year and the year before that, giving rise to all these types of different technologies. So think about what's possible just a few years from now. Think about what this means in digital, right? As, as these types of technologies now start to compound, take for instance the number of active users that are online, new users online by 2020, let me correct myself there. Right now they're around three billion users, three billion or so, probably around six billion cookie profiles or so. Three billion new users will come online for the very first time. These are clone companies that are providing smartphones at $10 price points in small villages in Africa, right? They don't have running water, but they have access to global markets now. They have access to cryptocurrencies to create new economies. They could trade Ethereum for bales of hay or buckets of water, which is setting precedent for a new kind of entrepreneurship, and it's exploding, right? If you think about the number of connected devices that are going to explode by 2020, 2025 or so, not to mention the number of real-time impressions that you guys are slicing and dicing via your platforms, right? It is quite significant, and you're going to need connected technologies to get this. But we still have one fundamental issue that has yet to be unpacked or deconstructed, and that's what I really want to talk about right now, and it's the marketer's dilemma. Every single one of you here, as a result of these democratized technologies, as a result of the explosion of mobility, the explosion of personal brands, you know that the democratization of these tools means that it's more accessible to you than ever before to start a brand, to launch a brand. But man, it is hard, right? It is hard to differentiate. It is hard to differentiate your brand amidst the complexity of solutions. We run into it every single day. How do you differentiate one technology platform from another? How do you differentiate one AI from another? How do you differentiate yourself when you're trying to get a new job? So this goes beyond the marketer's dilemma. This is everybody's personal dilemma. What is your purpose? How do you, how do you distinguish yourself from the masses? How do, you, how do you remove the clutter and do something significant and remarkable? And there's only one way to do that. It's to be remarkable. Right? So when we're thinking about connecting the dots, 
with exponential trends in these types of technologies, you have to think exponentially. So I go back to 1983, I love this example, Steve Jobs, everybody knows what he did. Everybody knows that he was the prolific visionary, but in 1983, right after Next tanked, and he was just about to get back into Apple, this was prior to the iPod launching, he decided on one singular mission, and that mission was to think different. So he decided, and there's a great video of this that I could send out, he said that he wants to create tools for the world so that everybody can create, everybody can produce, and they themselves can change the world. Now that's thinking exponentially. If you can create the tools and platforms that are going to embody this next phase, it wasn't just that he transformed five different industries, it was the fact that he democratized these tools to compound the rate at which innovation took place, and that is thinking exponentially, my friends. Every single one of you are trying to think like this. Every single brand is doing the exact same thing, building a foundation for data enablement, building a media execution on top of that so you can decide who to buy, right? Inventory sources, how do you spend your money most efficiently? How can you make the ads that you are sending across as relevant as possible? That's where the cognitive era comes into place. Every single one of you are trying to build this as a brand because all brands must move from becoming these legacy type of systems and into thinking like software companies, right? Agile methodologies, being more nimble with the market, being able to move with the market and being an intelligent brand that takes signals and understands these derivative signals that connect with audiences more meaningfully, being able to understand what is driving business performance and enhancing those types of experiences. This is a company called Emotive that I've been tracking. They've had fits and starts, but it is on her head a digital electroencephalogram that tracks the biochemistry in her head so that you could now start to understand the different patterns, the neural configurations that can essentially play video games, you can, you can launch platforms, you can basically think your way into controlling the world. And it is very interesting how these types of technologies are coming about. So when you start to understand how your brain works and you understand the individual patterns that are causing your behavior, your different types of experiences, only then can you understand the data sets that are engaging people, right? We've built a business since 2005 or so on carpet bombing individuals and then we call that prediction. We call that being able to contextually identify users one from another. But really, you're taking blind guesses intuitively. But it's only now that you can connect the dots with more data. So this is going to be huge when you could understand somebody's inherent drivers, inherent characteristics, what really moves them as an individual, somebody that wants to strive for social change versus somebody that wants to stand out from the crowd. That's going to be a unique type of platform, a unique type of opportunity for us to do this. And when we could now start to, at the very derivative levels, the, the distinct patterns of the brain, not just which hemisphere is lighting up, but which specific neurons are lighting up when somebody is engaged with an ad versus somebody that's angry and sad. Can't you guys see this happening right now, all the different signals that are being captured through all of our devices? This stuff is getting structured in real time, and it's scary, but it also provides an opportunity. It provides a great opportunity to do this. So in a world in which everything is based on data, we're all just bits and bytes, atoms, right? So we're all characteristics of data, constantly metabolizing and restructuring and, and being labeled from one platform to another. Data in this new world becomes currency. Data is currency, especially in a world in which blockchain is going to take this new kind of information and start to understand at a transactional level how data is being architected platform by platform, transaction by transaction, building a new kind of networked integrity. But in this cognitive universe, AI is there to provide this currency a means through which we are transacting, a means through which it's providing the right kind of experiences, performing being able to drive business performance and, of course, being able to predict the potential of every single engagement opportunity. And only then can we start to understand how this feels. Being in flow experience, right? So flow, 
I've been a flow junkie for quite some time, trying to understand the new levels in maximizing human performance at scale, what goes on in the brain when you are at your best, when you are taking into account all of the different faculties that you have and just killing it. And you don't want to go to the bathroom, you don't want to do anything else, you are just strictly in flow. It will be very interesting to see what happens in the brain when that happens. And it's my thesis that we are going to fundamentally understand how the specific brain patterns are working to do this, to deliver these kinds of experiences, because it's not just about being tuned into a device, right? So when you take a look at building the platforms that we have, we are creating augmented platforms. The platforms that we have right now are, exist upon the same fundamental architecture, enabling data at a foundational layer, at a foundational level. How can we understand all of the different clusters? How can we define these audiences more meaningfully? How can we activate those audiences across the board, across all of the channels that we have? And then how can we make all of those different experiences meaningful to them, right? Bottom layer, enriching it with data. Middle layer, activating it with media. Very top layer, constructing experiences based on the messages that are most predictive of the outcomes that you want to drive. But it shouldn't just be about trying to get people to engage as much as possible to their devices. I think brands really need to understand something much more than this, right? It's not just about keeping somebody locked into a device. It's more about creating remarkable products. And that's thinking exponentially. Can you actually create products that are going to change the world, like Steve Jobs had initially mentioned? So in this section now, we're going to break it down into something Fundamental, and I'm, I'm going way, way deep into the rabbit hole here, so bear with me. I promise to bring it back around into marketing technology and the stuff that we love so much, but just a fundamental philosophical question. Just sit back for a second and, you know, try to understand and think about what intelligence is. What is this notion of intelligence? How do we construct information in our own minds in a way that recognizes patterns, right? The fact that Every single one of you, when I raise this bottle up, you recognize it as a bottle of water, you recognize the edges, there's a portion of your brain, a specific neural configuration in your brain that recognizes the edges. This brand is Kirkland, there's a portion of your brain that recognizes the letter K, even the crossbar in the letter K. The fact that this line on the letter I is verticalized, there are different portions and modules of your brain that understand this and also different configurations of your brain that equate to a specific output, like me drinking right now. So if you take a look at the innovation landscape when it comes to AI, all the different use cases, and I'm not even talking about having to become a data scientist to understand all of these things, even though you will be more dangerous if you do as a marketer, because we're moving into a data-driven world, so being able to dissect these types of technologies, or at least fundamentally understand their use cases, makes you more dangerous. But if you look at these derivative patterns here, what, what is everybody trying to do? Everybody's trying to mimic how the brain works, right? And this is an interesting, scary thought, is that everything is, all these AI scientists are trying to do is they're trying to create models of models in simulated environments to mimic the real world. Not only are we trying to create these simulated environments, but we're fundamentally trying to understand individual connections between ideas. But this is something more interesting that I've noticed around patterns, because it's all physics, and it exists over time across different designs in nature. The riverbeds and the streams have the same way of distributing water, and it's constantly trying to create and manifest more flow for that which flows through it. So this is very deep theoretical physicist by the name of Adrian Bijan, who I also have the pleasure of speaking with at Cannes in a month from now. Um, he talked about the construct a law in a way that says that all things, animate and inanimate objects, are constantly changing their configuration to free up what flows through them. It's going to take a while to digest that because it took me forever to really fundamentally understand that, but you can dissect this construct a law into everything that we are, right? 
The alveoli in our brain, the way that a lightning bolt hits a church steeple is distributing that kind of energy. The way that information flows through the web, which is why we've created the democratized tools that we have via Google and Facebook and all the information being architected in real time are following these same fundamental principles, which is very interesting. But if you take it one little spark, you look at one little spark in the brain, it's not a light bulb moment. That's more the experience that you have, right? You, you walk away from a problem and all of a sudden, aha, I know what my solution is. An idea, from a physical perspective, it's actually a network. If you were to take one little tap into the brain in a modularized way, it's actually an intersection of all the different connections between them, and that's, that's when the spark comes. That's when a light bulb moment hits. So an idea is actually a network of all these different things. So when you're thinking about innovation in the spirit of Fusion 92, the more you diversify your thinking, the more that you look outside of your box, the more that you look outside and take a look at all of the different ways in which curiosity can manifest, that's really where innovation happens. That's how you catalyze innovation. But when you take a look at AI, AI is only doing three things to get to those light bulb moments, to get to those outcomes. It's only doing three things in marketing. It's there to drive business performance. It's there to provide insights on what actually drove Lyft, and that's why we've architected the kind of solutions that we have. And then right smack dab at the center, it's about providing enhanced experiences for the customer. And that's what AI is doing within this kind of environment, within marketing. And that's all it's doing. There's a lot of conversation right now around what makes one AI better than another. So in taking a look at that, you have to understand how AI is empowering you. So one good analogy for what makes one AI better than another is how mature is it? How proven is it? Have you been able to take a singular model or a pipeline of models the way that my my niece, Lyra, she's about four years old. She has a four-year-old brain that's just soaking up all of this information. So she has about almost a trillion neurons that are configuring right now, but she hasn't fumbled through the world to understand these things, to really structure the kind of information, to have the right kind of experience that a 40-year-old brain has. You need to go through the world to fundamentally understand these things. So how mature one AI determines its efficacy, right? The way that it adapts, can you leave an AI alone to learn by itself? Do you need to tactically optimize across the board and really just traffic 75 different ads to understand what specific derivative output will take to get you to the conversion goals that you have, to drive the conversion rate lift? And will it give you the empowered insights to achieve that same kind of performance? Could it possibly learn on its own? So taking a look at AI differentiation, AI that adapts, AI that is proven, and AI that empowers is really what's going to connect the dots between what is augmented and what will augment our own intelligence in the future. So how this works in a system, again, I'm taking a look at the micro and the macro here. From a system, a neuron that fires in the brain to get to a specific output, now, taking a look at a macro point of view, a macro framework of how an AI would work within a marketing technology infrastructure, as a brand, as a CMO, you're building this tool internally, right? You're taking a look at how to enable your data, like we mentioned before. You're taking a look at how to execute. You're taking a look at all of the different clusters that could potentially drive lift, all of the first-party data combined with third-party data, combining all of these different clusters in real time to get you to the right kind of outputs. Enhancing business performance, right? Enhancing customer experiences, providing insights that are actually going to drive that kind of lift to grow your business. And this is only going to start to scale out in the future. And that's what's making it so significant and interesting. We've started to unbundle our AI stack at Seismic, so starting to understand specifically what the AI did at the model attribute level, and then also, from a differentiation standpoint, having a modeling pipeline. Modeling pipeline is attributes that are constantly testing themselves, re-architecting themselves, changing based on the micro-calibrations that are taking place, the same way that a Google car drives, the same way that Waze takes you from point A to point B, 
with less friction as possible. That's what it's doing. That's what an AI is doing. And taking a look at now how to build this and scale this out across your organization. Augmented intelligence means if you are targeting your customer, if you are building these kind of profiles, they need to exist across systems, taking in data between media and context, with syndication tools, appending as many parameters as possible. That's obviously going to change with GDPR and new type of, type of restrictions based on how you utilize that data fundamentally. But this archetype is going to remain the same. This archetype of who your customers are, there are things that will change, there are things that will remain the same. Based on all of the different channels, based on the data that you can collect with your CRM, based on affinity and resonance scores, how likely a person is to convert on a specific ad, on a specific product, can you categorize those different types of solutions at scale? That's exactly what you are all building right now. Understanding the universal attributes, this very complex slide just breaks down all of the different distinct data assets that you have internally that are sitting in the chaotic mess across servers in different places, but you're trying to get organized about it. You're trying to understand the universal attributes. You need to understand the distinct attributes that you can classify as people most predictive of doing specific things, converting on specific messages, and of course, driving more lift across your goals. So taking that and looking at what kind of experiences would be most relevant, innovation itself, when you can dissect, when you can slice and dice all the individual attributes that motivate us as individuals, it's really this. It's not being tuned to a device. It's not being stuck on a device, even though they are, the neurons are firing in your brain. It's really optimal experience. So I would argue that innovation is optimal experience when we can be at our best, be most remarkable, when we are just in the zone and just doing our thing. This is truly when innovation happens, when we can connect the dots and see the Gestalt long view and really start to fundamentally understand that's when all the light bulb moments are hitting all the way across the board and remarkable things start to happen. And again, with the new data sets that we have within our own disposal, we could now start to dissect a world in which we don't even have cookies, a world in which we don't even have first party data. What if we could just take the moods and situations within the context of a specific environment and map that to the ad itself? What if we could just align the specific message with moods, descriptors, all of the things that make you receptive to this messaging right now? And the fact that I can identify you as somebody that wants to change the world, identify you as somebody that wants to stand out from the crowd, identify you as somebody that wants to take control of your life. All of these different things are inherent patterns like we keep mentioning. There is no data set that can curate this at scale right now, but there will be because we're starting to do it. So with that in mind, it's also changing and re-architecting the role as a marketer, right? Our roles as marketers will now fundamentally change so that we don't have to do all of these menial tasks, going from tactic optimization and targeting of segments and audiences to trafficking a bunch of stuff to 4,000 different versions. Automation are lower level tasks that are beneath you. All of these things that are creating new types of services for an agency environment, for your marketing organization, moving into the new world of marketing is using AI in an augmented way so that you can do more interesting stuff. Creative parameter testing, what's really driving lift across messages. Insights extraction, taking broad views of audiences across the board to make better distinct business decisions. Customer journey modeling, does it really provide a unique map, a dynamic map of the entire journey? What are the things that are popping up and bubbling up to the surface? What kind of information is getting scaled out like this in real time? Creative strategy and optimization. If you are building a marketing organization based on new, nimble, agile, strategic methodologies, you are employing this right now. Everybody needs to be a marketing technology consultant. Everybody needs to understand fundamentally these tools and be fluent in moving back and forth between technical fluency to brand strategy 
to marketing strategy, right? Every single one of us needs to think like an entrepreneur. Every single one of us needs to think like a startup because software is constantly iterating. It's iterative. And this is why I'm going back to that Marshall McLuhan quote, first we build the tools and then the tools build us because it's really about these technologies that are changing our lives, enhancing our lives for the better. Every single tool that we have is fundamentally changing the way our brains are working. So I would ask you all right now, if everything is a model of a model, then you have to question the nature of your reality. If we are building at a very fractal scale, simulated environments that could model the world and classify every single object and connect us with that information so that we can dissect it in real time, that is augmenting our brain. Everything in the world is changing exponentially. Everything. So are you ready for that change? Like I mentioned before, humanity's capacity to compute has been compounding and will continue to compound for as long as we've been able to measure it. Therefore, we must get ahead of it. We must stay relevant and we must build brands that are here to design a better world. And only by thinking exponentially can brands do this. If you just want to get into digital and just realize that, hey, we need to be on Instagram. Let's keep doing what we need to do and let's connect on social and let's be where the millennials are. If you don't want to create a remarkable product, a 10x product, an exponential product, I don't care who you are, what brand you are, personal or, or commercial, you will become irrelevant. So exponential marketing requires exponential thinking. And if you take away one thing whatsoever, innovation is driving all of this stuff, connect the dots with everything that you have. Go outside of your norm. Go outside of the tools and the platforms that you would essentially use. Read a book on physics. Read more about AI. Read about philosophy and bring those things together because it's all connected and we are all connected because chance favors the connected mind. Thank you.